Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the Acting Deputy Vice Chancellor of the College of Law and Management Studies, Professor Manigay Reddy, um, I wish to welcome everybody today uh, to extend a warm welcome to uh, everybody participating today. Um, in uh, the webinar entitled Ombuds in the Digital Age, Navigating Challenges and Opportunities. So today's webinar is uh, mainly to commemorate the Ombuds Day for 2023 and it is organized by the African Ombudsman Research Center in collaboration with the International Ombudsman Institute. So the focus of uh, today's webinar will be on um, digital communication and privacy rights and confidentiality within the ombuds process. So uh, I'll just mention some of today's uh, participants. So I'd just like to welcome the facilitator, um, Mr. Makwebu, who is the ombudsman of the city of Cape Town and our two speakers. Uh, Professor Manoj Maharaj of the School of Management, IT and Governance, as well as the Honorable Gabby Schwartz, the Austrian Ombuds person. So um, I, I, I'm sure this will be a very interesting and profitable seminar today. So I'm just going to now hand over to the acting public protector who's going to continue with the next stage of the webinar. Thank you, everybody. A very good morning. Um, I'm honored this morning to be given the opportunity to, to say remarks on behalf of AOC as the acting chairperson of AOC to this prestigious uh, once more um, webinar. We normally say it is by Africa for the world because it is not only us as Africans who actually benefit um, from these um, webinars, but it is the entire ombudsmanship and interested parties in the topics that we deal with. Allow me this morning firstly to acknowledge the University of KwaZulu Natal through its representatives, the support that they continue to provide to us. Let me also thank the Ombudsman um, for the City of Cape Town for agreeing to participate uh, here. It is indeed through um, Ombudsmanship, but as well, let me also acknowledge the role that's been played by the IOI um, in supporting this uh, knowledge and fountain of knowledge um, for us as ombudsmen, academics, and other interested parties. Now, this morning, we are privileged to deal with a topic, a very critical topic at this age, uh, ombudsmen in the digital age, navigating challenges and opportunities. Now, um, for instance, we have across the world began to digitalize, digitize and transform digitalization, but um, for countries particularly such as ours, we remain in an age where the people whom we serve 
don't even have electricity, let alone to speak about signals in their respective areas, and also not affording the technology that is required um, to be part of the digitalization era. How do we bridge this, this digital divide as ombudsman? However, digitization is here. It is not something of the future. It is something of the present, and it continues to enhance itself. And we have seen how COVID-19 has actually forced us into the digital age. Like with all societal developments, whether they are our bonimores or technological, philosophical, or climatic, just to name a few, at some stage it becomes necessary for society to engage in this discourse about what these developments mean to us, why they are beneficial, to whom are they beneficial, how they can be manipulated, and of course, why and how it is important for them to be regulated in varying degrees in the context of institutions such as ours, the ombudsman, whom are designed to investigate misconduct that can be described in different ways from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. It is a necessary component of our existence that we not only acquaint ourselves with societal developments, but indeed that we master them. For you cannot be a referee in a game you do not understand. As ombudsman institutions, once again, with slight variance between jurisdiction, we are usually the final hope of the disenfranchised. We are people who have chosen to make a daily of occurrence of being the proverbial David against the Goliath. With such a mammoth comprising our daily lives, we must be adequately equipped to face the challenges we are likely to encounter along the way, recognizing the magnitude of the role we have chosen to play in bettering the lives of the respective communities that we are entrusted to protect. Now, in the years past and at the time of the establishment of institutions, many of us, present, there were none of the contemporary means of communication and the like. We are fortunate enough to have access to more and more technology as we expand and including for our reach. Internet access, which is very crucial to assessing information, to accessing information rather these days, remains a pipe dream for many of fellow South Africans and indeed for many others in some part of the developing and underdeveloped um, countries. Many are unable to access information that would help them vindicate their rights and thus remain trapped in less than favorable circumstances as a direct result and consequence of a lack of access to information. The use of digital platform provides us with all with greater access to information at our fingerprints. With such information, we are able to advance ourselves and increase our, our prospects and development. Consequently, technical education and economic empowerment are undoubtedly dramatic gains, uh, bring dramatic gains in human development and well-being for individuals, families, and society. But however, you can also not speak of digital transformation without speaking of economic empowerment. These two go hand in hand. Now, platforms that we now easily access ourselves amongst, like we are doing now, like visual workshops, virtual information sessions, exhibitions, new media, etc like social media and so forth deals with issues of digitalization and requires digitalization in order to access information. But also our investigations are also advancing to that particular aspect of digitalization. For instance, the case management system, their self portal on the referral applications, which mostly benefits those who have. And now in conclusion, allow me um, facilitated that for as long as uh, access to advanced digital technology remains a dream for vulnerable members of our society and empowerment and related economic opportunities will also remain elusive for as long as a lack of empowerment of economic deprivation remains a way of life to many of our society 
the future looks bleak, particularly for us as uh, developing and underdeveloped countries. We all have in our respective roles and obligation to ensure that the freedoms of others are greatly enhanced. In that way, we would be giving meaning to a prolonged life to the constitutional projections of our countries. An enormous welcome to you all. I trust that we all will gain immensely from this um, very productive discussion and will be able to contribute. I thank you. Uh, sorry, I will start again so that the, you can hear the voice, the volume. My apologies, looks like you can't hear. Let me just play again, my apologies. I'll just change the... Mm -hmm. Well, good morning, and I'm delighted to join you for this important webinar entitled Ombuds in the Digital Age, Navigating Challenges and Opportunities. Well, I welcome the speakers in today's webinar, and I thank them for their time and expertise. I also welcome all participants in today's webinar from both the nations of Africa, but indeed around the globe. And I particularly want to acknowledge two speakers today, the Chair of the Austrian Ombudsman Board and Secretary General of the International Ombudsman Institute, Ombudswoman Svartz, and the Acting Public Protector of South Africa and the Acting Chairperson of the AORC Board, Advocate Galeka. Both are deeply valued colleagues, both are friends, and both are what we will continue to make the world a better place, exceptional women leaders. It is particularly significant that this event is being held on Ombuds Day, celebrated annually on the second Thursday in October since 2018. As you know, Ombuds in Africa and around the world promote and protect good governance, the rule of law and fundamental human rights. The world has never needed Ombudsman as much as it does now. This webinar explores how an institution that is centuries old can both enhance its work for citizens through technology, but also how that technology can both challenge us and the citizens we serve. 
Well, I welcome this discussion and the International Ombudsman Institute, or IOI, is proud to join with the AORC in this most timely of discussions. Well, next year, I will travel to Botswana and South Africa as part of my commitment and the commitment of the IOI to the exceptional contribution of the Ombuds of Africa. Well, what an extraordinary pleasure it will be for me to join my dear colleagues. Today, I want to end my remarks by acknowledging and thanking all Ombuds for their work, wherever they are in the world. I particularly acknowledge, thank and celebrate the work of the AORC. I have previously expressed my view, and I repeat it again today, that the AORC undertakes world-leading ombudsman research, discussion and training. And I also thank the University of Kuala Zulu Natal, a world-leading university, for their support of the AORC. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to the president of the IOI, Honorable Chris Field, for his welcome address and the motivation uh, he has given us uh, to, to be excited and to look to the deliberations of today. Ladies and gentlemen, as the program reflects, my name is Busum Zimagwebu. I am the city ombudsman of the city of Cape Town. So Cape Town is beautiful this morning. The sun is shining. Service delivery is up on the road. Uh, we're getting things done. It is an awesome privilege this morning that uh, I've been invited to really do the simplest task and the humbling task to facilitate uh, this uh, interaction today and this webinar. As we celebrate the Ombuds Day 2023 and uh, looking at the theme or the topic before us this morning, Ombuds in the Digital Age Navigating the Challenges and Opportunities. I am excited this morning that we have experts that will help us this morning as we ponder this uh, topic and this uh, important subject uh, that uh, they will give us insights and uh, thoughts and uh, views that we can benefit as individuals as we converge in this webinar this morning across all the oceans of the world uh, and uh, as we seek to really um, empower each other. This morning, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, um, we have two speakers, uh, Professor Manoj Maharaj. Uh, you'll take uh, 15 minutes max. I would uh, make sure that prof I assist you when uh, you have three minutes or two minutes, I will invite you to really wrap up so that uh, we can then uh, keep, uh, keep, keep time. But uh, I think 15 minutes will be adequate as indicated in the, pro in the program. If one has got questions, ladies and gentlemen, keep those questions. Oh, my bad. I see uh, Professor um, Maharaj, I made a mistake, he's got 30 minutes. 30 minutes, so as we wrap up, uh, five minutes uh, countdown, I would uh, assist you, Prof, uh, so that we can wrap up and then if there are questions, ladies and gentlemen, let's keep them in the chat box. Uh, when both speakers are done, we will have 20 minutes um, where we do the Q&A. After Professor Maharaj, we will have um, the second speaker. The second speaker will also uh, assist us uh, in pondering this topic. The second speaker is the Austrian Ombudsperson and the IOA Secretary General, uh, Gabby Swartz. We will have a video, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, uh, I must apologize on her behalf. She's unable to join us uh, this morning. However, uh, if there are any questions, they will be sent to her, and then she will reply in writing to those uh, who have raised those questions. My sincere apologies. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me go to our first uh, expert this morning, Professor Manoj Maharaj. Now, quick uh, introduction of our expert this morning is as follows, is the following. Professor Maharaj is a highly respected figure in the School of Management, uh, IT and Governance at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. 
He has a remarkable career spanning over 30 years. He has made a lasting impact in academia. He possesses a profound understanding of legislation, policies, and procedures pertaining to state-owned enterprises, establishing him as a sought-after authority in this field. Professor Maharaj's knowledge of over has been ever evolving ICT sector is unparalleled. His in-depth research and numerous publications have significantly contributed to advancing knowledge and innovation. Beyond his achievements, Professor Maharaj is passionate about fostering the growth of future scholars. He has played a pivotal role in developing intellectual capacity. And uh, therefore, this morning, we should all be excited about looking forward to what he has for us this morning. Professor Maharaj will help us navigate the challenges the digital uh, age has presented us with. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Professor Manoj Maharaj. Professor, over to you, sir. My apologies. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Chair, for that uh, welcome. It's always strange when somebody's introducing you. You wonder who they're talking about. Uh, but indeed, I've, I've been around for a long time. And uh, I started off in, I'm a mathematician by training. And of course, now in IT for many years. And uh, uh, I have huge numbers of students all over the world who graduated under my supervision. So yes, um, I am passionate about, uh, about ICT and uh, ICT for development and, you know, the, the, the public protector um, alluded to this in her talk. And we, we're not talking about this today because uh, that, that could set me off uh, talking for a long time about the digital divide. But, but she's correct. I mean, you know, uh, the technology is, is, is I call it an, uh, a, an, an amplifier. If, if you have it and you're great, it, it makes you it, it makes you excellent. It, it it makes you greater. If you don't have it and you don't utilize it, it just you know it 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 drags you down. And this is what essentially the digital divide is. So it's something that that uh, you know we we need to take seriously and, and need to consider carefully as 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 we uh, uh, navigate this uh, digital world that we. Uh, are, are not entering, we have entered. We have entered this digital world for 40 years, 50 years now, I would think. But only now are we seeing the great advantage, uh, I think, uh, that, that digitalization can bring. And we, we're not even touching on the advent of artificial intelligence and how that is accelerating this divide and uh, the, the digitalization of the world. But uh, you know, digitalization brings with it many uh, benefits, obviously. And and uh, but but many concerns. And from a legal perspective, uh, you know, as as ombuds people throughout the world, you deal with the legal and the moral perspective of of, of digitalization, uh, primarily that of uh, privacy and confidentiality. I'm not a legal expert, uh, but but uh, I can talk about the technology technological side of it, because it is through these through these technologies that uh, these violations first occur. And when these violations occur, then it is the legal people who have to start dealing with the consequences of it. So first we need to understand how these things happen. And, and, and this, is, this is where my talk sits today. It sits in this, uh, in this area about, of, of privacy rights and confidentiality. How, how, how do we protect it? But more importantly, what do we need to protect against? Uh, you know, what do we need to be aware of? As individuals, forget the fact that you're all ombuds people and professionals in your own disciplines in your countries, but as individuals, how does this affect us? Because you act as an individual, you don't act as an ombuds person uh, when you click on a link or you, or you visit a website or, or you uh, engage uh, with, with technology. So, so I, I want to take you through this and maybe let, let's see, I'm going to share my screen now and let's see where we go from there. All right, uh, I'm assuming you can see, see my screen. And uh, let me start the slideshow. So I'm talking about privacy rights and confidentiality in the digital era. Uh, 
and technology and tools for secure communication. The title is a bit uh, confusing, perhaps. Uh, originally, I was going to talk with technology and tools. Somebody else was going to talk of privacy rights, but I was asked to do both, which is why I'm taking a technology aspect to both, uh, whereas I expect that the first talk, the first part of this talk was probably going to be from a legal perspective. But, but I think it's important that we understand uh, the technological aspect of it. Okay. So we talk of CIA. The CIA, and I'm not talking about the CIA. Uh, the CIA is critical for most information, right? But, but what does CIA stand for? You may have heard this term is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And, and from a technical aspect, uh, from an information security perspective, uh, you know, we need to assign value to things if we need to protect it. And, and, and you might, you know, this is, this is normal. If you have a car, you insure your car. Uh, your, the, the amount of insurance you pay is dependent on the value of that car. You insure your house or whatever it is you want to insure, uh, as an example, it's based on the value. Now, if you want to protect information or insure, you know, uh, uh, ensure the protection of information, in other words, you want to put in technological uh, uh, artifacts into your environment that protects this information, you, you need to understand how valuable is this information so that you can then... Uh, get in technological to technical experts to come and say, I need to protect this. This information is valued at so many dollars. And, and we do that in, this, in, 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 the, in the information security uh, domain by measuring what we call the confidentiality requirements, the integrity requirements, and the availability requirements of this information. Confidentiality, I think we understand. And integrity is more than just how truthful the information is or how trustworthy the information is but how, how you can prove that it is truthful and trustworthy. In other words, how you can prove that the information was not being altered by an unauthorized person and, and things like that. We're not gonna go into those details, but that's what that stands for. And availability is measuring how available that information is, how accessible it is and, and, and things like that. So in other words, information that is stored in a locked box, encased in, in, in a steel safe and dumped in the bottom of the ocean, it's extremely safe. Nobody can get at it, but it is not available. It is not accessible. So it's useless. So as technology te technology experts and as public uh, 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 servants, as, as all ombuds are, you have to thread this fine line between making this information available to the public, but also protecting its confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And we're going to try and delve into that over here, and, and you know, not, not, not in too much detail, obviously. So data is the heart of the modern enterprise. I mean, wherever you go in this day and age, it is data. Right now, in this webinar, your data is being shared with the, with the Zoom platform. We will be using Zoom with the Zoom platform. Where is this data stored? I mean, you know, we, we're using Zoom at UKZN. Uh, uh, we've got participants from all over the world in, 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 this, uh, in this webinar. Where's your data? Uh, you know, your name, your ID, uh, your, not your ID number, your, your email address and your name is, is, is somewhere in this environment. It's stored on a server somewhere because it had to be stored to enable this transaction. In other words, this, this communication that we have. Okay. There are various laws in, in different countries that, that require that the, that, that the data is, is stored in country physically. Uh, and and, you know, and uh, Zoom and Teams and, and, and Microsoft Meet, et cetera, and all, in some sense, all violate this. Uh, because your data is right now being stored in a country that's different from your home country, in a sense. Okay, so so we need to understand this, uh, but we but we can't let the 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 uh, you know the the requirements of privacy hinder development. So the fact that privacy is hard to protect doesn't mean should, we should lock up shop and say we're not going to share information, we're not going to become digitalized, because you know uh, 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 our data can be stolen. You drive to work every day. Uh, many people, or you, or you take transport to work every day, uh, but there's a non-zero probability that in that process, you will meet an accident and die or get injured. But you don't say, I'm not going to work because of that. It's, it's, a, it's a risk that you take. It's a measured risk. And you do everything to protect yourself. You wear a seatbelt, you, know, you, you, drive, you drive within the speed limit, you drive carefully. These are all the things you do to mitigate the risk, all right? Uh, but you still drive to work. This is the thing about, uh, about uh, understanding the, the, the balance between uh, digitization and privacy. We must understand the risks, but we take, we mitigate those risks as best we can. And this is what this talk is today 
about, right? So, so, so data is invaluable for enhancing user experiences, optimizing services, but, but, but malicious access is there. The biggest criminal enterprise in the world today, it used to be 20 years ago, it used to be the international drug trade was one of the biggest uh, 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 criminal enterprises in the world. You know, the, the amount of money in the international drug trade was, it was and is a tremendous amount of money. Think about all the drugs being traded in the world. Yeah. The information uh, marketplace, the illegal information marketplace is orders of magnitude bigger than the international drug trade in terms of dollars, in terms of money. So, so data is, data is in, 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 uh, critically important. It's critically important to criminals. This is why they always want to try and steal your data. And that is why we always need to try and protect that data. So how do, how do people, how, how, are data, how is data collected in a, in a uh, uh, legal sense? Social media interactions, Zoom, Facebook, uh, uh, TikTok, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn. Many of you, are, all of your professionals, most of you will be on LinkedIn. Uh, and, and LinkedIn's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a sober platform. I call it a sober platform with people like us on it. But it's still a source for, uh, for criminals to, to steal information. E-commerce platforms, you shop online, you have to share information. Health and fitness apps, who thought? You, you're wearing a Fitbit or you're wearing an Apple smartwatch or a Samsung smartwatch and you're sharing information with the server. Where is that server? When you're sharing information with Apple servers, they all over the world. When you're sharing information with Samsung servers, they all over the world. Fitbit as well, right? So where's your data going? Your heart rate, your, you, you know, you, you upload your weight, your height, your all kinds of personal information for that app to help you. But you have to exchange. In, 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 there's an exchange. There's a sharing. You, you, I give you my information, you give me support. Uh, you know, when I say you, I mean the technology. Smart home devices. If you've got smart switches at home that you can switch off on the web and you think, oh, that's, that's very nice. I have my house and got smart switches. I can turn on my lights uh, from wherever in the world I am because it's all Wi-Fi enabled. But there's a trade-off. I trade off my data uh, with a web server somewhere in the world. I, I know where it is because I, uh, I work with this particular company. Uh, but my information is there. Now, if, 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 if there are malicious actors who can access that server, they can extract information about my house, um, you know, physically where it is and what switches on, on, uh, on, on Wi-Fi and they could turn on and off the switches if they wanted and, and maybe other things as well. So it's a trade-off, okay? So we need to understand this. And, and in, in your work environment, I, I'm not delving into your particular work environment because I don't understand it as well as, well as I do, you know, this environment. But you need to relate what I'm saying to your environment and understand how it is that the data that you have may be compromised either through your personal actions or through your corporate actions. And your personal actions become critical when you take work home. When you take a work home from your office computer and you plug it into your home computer because you're diligent and you want to work at home, but you're on your home computer, you're also on Facebook at the same time, you're on Instagram, or you're doing something else at the same time while you're doing your work, that work is compromised, potentially, unless, of course, you are secure. And, and we like to all assume that we're secure, but unless we know, unless we know what we're talking about, we probably we probably are not. Okay. So what are the implications of this data? Now, uh, oh, this is this is about the information you're sharing legally. I'm not talking about compromised data. Okay. This is the information that you put on your fitness app. This is the information you put on your LinkedIn profile, and the photos that you publish to 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 Facebook, etc. Okay. Banks can see your social media post to ascertain your credit worthiness. And if you put it out there, it is fair game. You can't put it out there and say to the banks, oh, you shouldn't have used it because it's private. It's not private if it's on Facebook, okay? Uh, insurers may use it to post to deny claims. And this, this happens often. Uh, you know, you, you see these in dramatizations in, in legal uh, dramas, but they're all based on reality. The, the, the case law is much less exciting than the drama is, but, but it's the same thing. When somebody claims, you know, to be uh, affected by X, Y, and Z, but the insurers go and check the social media posts and see that this guy was having a party on that day, or he was smoking, or he was drinking, or whatever, and use that to try and deny the claim. It's open uh, 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 game, if you will. You put it out there, it's available. Employers, employers might use social media to before making a job offer. Youngsters like posting on, on the web, you know, the great party they had and, and and the lots of drinking and you know whatever it is you you, you see these things, 
And uh, or you read about them, and uh, you wonder why are they doing that? Why do youngsters do this? Why are they come from? The youngsters get old. You know that's the idea behind living. You you, you want to get old. You you, but 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 whatever you sow in the in, in your in your youth comes back to haunt you in later life. We see this in the U.S. elections and elections all over the world where opposition research picks up this thing that you did in good faith or in good fun rather, not in good faith. But you know when you when you're young, you really don't know what you're doing most of the time. But twenty years down the line, that's held against you on the assumption that you should have known what you're doing. So these things are these things are, are important. They're not trivial. Okay? And uh, and understand that the, the same the same kind of data uh, that you place on social media or in other platforms uh, today could be used 10 years down the line by malicious actors who troll the web, find this information and use it to blackmail you, for example. So, so you know, these are all, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be... Uh, 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 doomsday-ish about this. Uh, I'm, I'm not painting such a picture that it's all bad, but but my, my my intention here is to make you aware that these are potentialities uh, that do exist. Uh, I'm not here to talk about the good of data. I think we all know that, and and you know we we can we can talk about that uh, for for many hours. Okay, but we all have a right to privacy. Okay, uh, and and all countries have privacy rights to some level. South Africa has Popia and, you know, in, in South Africa, where Popia, uh, the, the Europeans have the GDPR, uh, uh, their data protection laws, uh, the Americans have surveillance Oxley on the financial side, uh, they have hyper or health information uh, protection uh, act. There, there are all kinds of acts. Like you, you, can, you can look through your, I mean, you're far more qualified than this than I am, but to, to recognize that in your domain, what are the protections that, the legal protections that you have. But if you have to invoke the legal protections, it is too late. It's too late. Often it is too late because it means you haven't protected your data in the first place. Okay. So the, the, these laws don't prevent criminal exploitation especially cross-border, because the laws that apply in Botswana don't apply in South Africa generally. I mean, they might be similar, but they're different laws. Okay, So somebody sitting in, in some country in Europe uh, violates your privacy by hacking your system and stealing your data. But the person in that country X in, in Europe or wherever in the world okay, has not violated any local laws. In country Y, which is my country, they've stolen my data, so they violated some laws. But but who is it? Who you know that, that person who violated the laws do, doesn't exist in South Africa, doesn't live in South Africa. The servers don't live in South Africa. So who do we sue? Okay. So this is the the the, the pan jurisdictional, multi dimensional nature of of data flows. Okay. Pan jurisdiction across across many jurisdictions, but multidimensional. I mean, you know, it flows via telephone, it flows via the web, it flows via the newspapers. I mean, this multidimensional flow of this data makes this a very very complicated domain. And the best way to deal with this as an individualist, it's you know, while you have the right to privacy, you also have the responsibility for this privacy. We we tend to always try and invoke our rights, and and tend to forget that. We also have this responsibility. You're responsible for your own privacy. Certainly, you have a right to it, but you're responsible. If you don't take the responsibility of protecting your privacy, then you can't claim these rights um, uh, because you were careless. I mean, again, this is a non-legal opinion, and you might uh, uh, shoot holes in it, but this is just my personal opinion from, from a non-legal perspective. But from purely technical perspective, I need to tell you this. While you might have these rights, the responsibility for protecting your data is your own. And the way to do this is to get knowledgeable, to understand. Uh, uh, don't, you don't need to understand the technology the way I do it. You don't need to understand the technical aspects about data and networks, et cetera, the way I do it. That's not necessary. But you need to be able to know what questions to ask. And if you know the questions to ask, 90% of your problem is solved. I tell this to my students all the time. <coughs> ask the right questions, and then you have no problems. Often we are asking the wrong questions. And this is fundamentally what happens in, 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 in this, in this in technology domain as well. People ask the wrong questions. And I'm here to try and tell you that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do it in half an hour, clearly, but try and tell you that this is what you need to do. You need to be able to ask the right questions. Okay. So knowledge and awareness, you need to be educated about what is possible. And then you do this by YouTube is the greatest learning environment ever in the history of humankind. You could go there, 
put a put a search in there and spend half an hour a day watching some videos about privacy protections, about data flows and things like this. You'll be surprised what you can learn. Okay. Now, of course, but benefits with, with, with you know with, with data sharing, personalized healthcare. My DNA, uh, you know, I, I've, uh, I've done this uh, DNA mapping thing. Yeah. It comes out of various names in, in various parts of the world. It, it tells me where my history is uh, from, a, from a genetic perspective. But the value of this is that this DNA is stored and part of the contract I have with this company, I paid them to do this, as, as many of you would have, is that if there are any developments in, in, in uh, genetics, and if it impacts upon me because they have my genome, whatever it, whatever it is they call it, you know, my genetic makeup, they will email me and say, hey, we've got this data. It's interesting. So it's a, it's a show. Personalized healthcare, it's coming. You know, it, it's coming. The, the technology is there. Uh, the, the legal domain hasn't caught up yet. Right? Personalized shopping, we all experience that. I would think, I certainly experience that. Personalized shopping, when I go onto a website to do shopping, they know generally what I want. Um, I want to woodworking tools and I want to do some uh, this and that. That's what I'm shopping for all the time. So it automatically comes up. You know? So I, I don't mind that. I, I'm happy with that. Okay. But if you're a data custodian, which is ombuds offices throughout the world, when people come to you for help, they give you their data. You're a data custodian. The problem is far more pressing. Your responsibility is not personal anymore. Your responsibility are to everybody's data that you hold. And I, 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 I'm personally having major problems with this. I mean, legal problems, I'm in court at the moment with, with the master's office in, in Durban, in South Africa, which has absolutely no idea, in my opinion, on you know, what data protection is and, and how to deal with it. So, so you know, we're going to be in court soon uh, dealing with this. Not only that, with, with the banks as well, who have just uh, played uh, uh, you know, loosely, with, with, certainly with my data. But, 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 but these are issues, many people don't even know that they have these rights because they don't understand uh, the, you know, the technical details surrounding their data and how it is that the data is compromised. It is just this big black hole that everybody's scared to enter um, uh, you know, when, when you talk of technology and this technophobia, you know, which, which is actually being exploited by uh, criminals throughout the world. So the dark side of data collection, data brokers. I mean, I spoke about this at the beginning. Data brokers, I mean, they, they will steal your data. They'll sell your data bit for one US cent or 10 US cents, depending on whether it can be verified or not, or 20 US cents if it is something else, if it is more than one piece of data. It might not seem like a lot of money, but take a million pieces of data, take 10 million, 20 million, and suddenly you start seeing the value of this for criminals to get this. When you get spam email, selling you anything, insurance or, or this or that, your data was compromised, okay? Your email address was compromised. There are websites on the web that you can go and check you know, or whether, whether your email address has been compromised. So there's unauthorized data access, you know, and, and, and that, that can be in your office where you're dealing on a case and your, your, your friend or your work colleague, work colleague comes and looks at this data. They're not authorized to do so. And we just don't worry about it because it's, it's okay, it's a colleague. All right, but, but that shouldn't be happening, right? Uh, surveillance capitalism, the, the, uh, Shoshana Zuboff, um, I don't know this person, but I, I got this data, described the monetization of personal data through surveillance. And, and, and those of you of many years ago uh, may have watched the movie called The Truman Show with, uh, with uh, uh, I forget his name now, the, the actor anyway, but, but uh, where this, this person grew up in this bubble and, and he was just watched 24 seven by cameras. And they were selling his life on, on, the, on the television channels um, uh, outside, outside that bubble. This is exactly what surveillance capital is. Okay? And, and, you, and you see that in the Big Brother shows. I, don't, I never watch them, but I, but I know about them. The Big Brother and the, and the similar shows that many people watch you know, on, on television. They're big hits, apparently. Uh, it's just as voyeurism in, 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 in human nature, I think. But that's surveillance capitalism. They're monetizing the surveillance of a group of people, uh, the survivor series and things, all of these things, all surveillance capitalism. They're monetizing the personal data, the personal the privacy. There's no privacy in these big brother houses, right? Uh, uh, and, 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 and they're monetizing. That's what surveillance capital is, okay? But it started off, the earliest examples of that that I can recall is this, is this movie called The Truman Show. If you haven't seen it, you know, go and watch it. So what are the challenges in secure communication? You know, these are all the issues about privacy and data protection and things that you that you have to deal with. But there are third-party risks. I mean, uh, as, as an ombuds office, 
you rely on a third party to be able to provide you with techno, te technology services. And as a legal office, you probably don't have the expertise at the level that you need from a technology perspective, because you probably don't think it's necessary. Uh, because you think, oh, we're an ombuds office, we don't need an IT uh, expert. You know, but, but the fact, as, 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 uh, as the uh, public protector said, you know, we, we move into the digitized world. So if we, are, if we are moving into this, digital, if, we, if we are in this digitized world, you have to have somebody within your environment that understands this digitized world purely from that perspective, not from the ombuds perspective, not from a legal perspective, but from a technical perspective. Otherwise, you lose the plot. And, and I've been trying to say this to, to, to businesses and companies out there who say, oh, we're not in the IT business. We don't need an IT expert. I say precisely because you're dealing with everything you do is IT related, it means that you need an IT expert. You need somebody you can trust who works for you to be able to tell you what's going on. And you may need to be able to have the conversation with him or her to be able to say, this is what I need, right? So this is, this is the problem. So third party risk, because we outsource, you see, when we outsource our technology, we, we tend to subconsciously outsource the responsibility for the security of the technology. That's not how, that's not how it works. And that's not how the legal framework works as well. Uh, certainly in South Africa, you can outsource technology, but the responsibility for to your clients for the security of the data that you're outsourcing is still yours. It's not your technology partners. Okay, if I deal with you and you outsource uh, my data to a data broker to to manage it to something, but that is stolen from that side. I mean, I'm not going to go to that third party. I come to you. So you're still responsible for it. So, so we need to understand this. That's why technical expertise is important in every office. Outdated technology, because we don't understand what, what it is. Because technology works, we're scared to change it. We don't keep track. And I can understand that technology changes so rapidly. And often the, the changes are purely driven by commerce and, and the monetization by the, by the technology companies. You know, they make a small change and they sell you a new product and the old product is, is outdated. That is just, uh, you know, it's, it's not right, but I, I, you know, we can't change that. But technology does move and, and we need to keep pace. But I don't think you need to change your tech computer every year or every two years as the IT companies would tell you. But certainly I, I use my computers five, 10 years sometimes before I change them, okay? Because I understand I need it for what it is. I don't need it for the bells and whistles. When somebody tells your computer, they say, you need a fastest computer in the world. You need so much RAM. You need this and that. And you think, my God, you it's so much money. Why do I need it? But all I do is, you know, email and I browse the web and I do some documents. I do some Word, uh, you know, and, and some spreadsheets or whatever it is that you do. So, so, so this is a problem, but the other side is also a problem because, you know, you don't have to be at the cutting edge, but certainly you don't want outdated technology. Human error, technophobia I spoke about earlier. Because you fear it, you stay away from it. And if you stay away from it, others exploit that gap, right, that, 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 that you are creating. So you need to get over this technophobia, okay? And this is linked to the lack of knowledge. And it links to the previous slide, you know, uh, well, somewhere else I said, uh, you know, you need to be educated. You need, and, and, and that's your responsibility. It could, you, you could say it's your boss's responsibility, uh, you know, or your, you know, to, to provide that training. Of course, but you still have to learn from it. Providing the training and you learning from it are two different things. You can sit in this webinar here today and just listen and not learn a thing, or you can inv involve yourself in this webinar, listen critically and learn something. So the act of learning, you know, the, the act of addressing this lack of knowledge is purely your responsibility. It's nobody else's. I mean, if somebody can provide the learning platform. They can put me in front of you to talk to you. Uh, and, and put other experts in to talk about other issues. But the point, but, but to learn from it, it's, it's your responsibility, it's nobody else's, okay? Encryption, uh, you know, I was asked to talk about encryption. I said, you know, encryption is such a complicated thing. Halfway, is, and, I yeah. appreciate it. You can wrap up, you've got four minutes to go. Okay, I'm, I'm about finished now, thank you. Thank okay. you. So encryption is the backbone, it's, it's everywhere, okay? And I'm not gonna talk anymore about that, <laughs> but that sits at your, that, that, that sits at the back end of all web services, okay? It's there, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and all of these tools are there. Virtual private, you've heard about this. I spoke about it in the last talk I gave to this, this, this platform. You've heard of two-factor authentication. You, you get an SMS to your phone with a, with a pin, that's two-factor authentication. Secure video conferencing tools like, like, like what we're using right now. 
digital signature services, don't worry too much about that. But, but those are services that are available out there. And, uh, and some other time when, when, you know, if the ARC has a need, we can speak more, in more detail about the tools that are available to you for secure communications. Okay. What I want to talk about here for two minutes is phishing. I mean, this is the primary vector where data is stolen, where you are responsible for this data not being stolen. Okay. And what does that involve? You've got the fake invoice. You, you get an email saying, oh, listen, you paid this thing, but there's an error in this invoice. Please click on this link to fix it. You go and click on it and your data is stolen. There's a request from the boss. You, you're sitting at home in country X and your boss sends you an email. Hey, listen, I'm stuck in country Y. I need some money urgently. Please, please contact me. He says, oh, it's my boss. Let me click on the link. That's it. Your money's gone. Okay. Request for account verification. Your bank sends you a letter saying we have a problem with your account. Please click on this link and fix this account. Your data is stolen. Your money is stolen. Okay. Because your banks never send you a link to click on. Important legal documents to preview. You get a document and you might see this often. In your environment, you'll get a legal sounding uh, uh, email saying, listen, we've got this important document, legal document, a case between X and Y. You don't know all the cases that are happening in the office. You might think this is an important case. You click on the link, your data is stolen. Your data is compromised. Your office is compromised. Okay. Tax refund email during tax year. It's a tax, tax year time now in South Africa, right? You get emails. So your tax refund is available. Your tax is due. Another uh, related uh, scam is, uh, couriers send you, listen, your parcel is waiting. Uh, please click on this link to, to claim your parcel because, you know, we, we can't find you. You haven't ordered anything, but the the nature of human, uh, human nature is that, oh, maybe I'm getting something for free. Let me click on this link. And of course, all your data is stolen. Okay? Friend message on social media, it's the same thing. You get a friend request, you click on it because, oh, that guy looks neat or that girl looks not pretty. You know, let me, let me click on that link. That's it, your data is stolen. All of these things, best practice, awareness, never share your passwords, never use your password across, never share your password across two different domains, never use personally identifiable information for a password. Not your name, not your husband's name, your wife's name, your cat's name, your dog's name, your children's name. We can find it. If you do that, we'll find it. Right? Use two-factor authentication. Verify and explain. You get a request to click on a link. Don't click on the link, please. Ask somebody else. Did you expect this email? Do you think it's coming to you? And, and, and don't do that. Don't use public Wi-Fi. <coughs> Wi-Fi is expensive in most countries. We go to the mug and bean, we go to the equivalent to use public Wi-Fi. If you're using public Wi-Fi, never use public Wi-Fi for anything that requires authentication. If you are required to type in your username and password for anything, never use public Wi-Fi for that. Never. And I'm saying never. There's no exceptions to this. Because if you do, you're compromising your, your, your environment, okay? Uh, monitor your account activity. Take advice from experts. They know what they're talking about. You don't know. You know you're an expert in your field. Listen to other people. Okay. Learn how to use digital signatures. I spoke about that just now. Share and discuss. When you, when you get an email saying, "Hey, you're a millionaire because somebody you know you won this thing," ask your friend if they received that same email. And invariably, they did. If not today, yesterday, or the day before. You know, it's a scam. Nobody's that lucky to receive a sudden email draw to make them rich, okay? So this is it, you know, you have to make you aware, uh, half an hour is, is a short time, but I just want to give you a high level overview of what it is out there and what it is you can do, uh, you know, and, and primarily it is about your personal role in this and becoming aware, okay? Seek out training opportunities and don't train to tick that box. Don't go and get that training to comply because too much of what we do today is compliance rather than fundamental learning, okay? Because cybersecurity is not about your, uh, your, your ombuds office. It's not about your boss. It's not about the people you work for. It is about your personal and family life. This is it. If you understand that your digital security is about your personal and family life, you'll take it more, more seriously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. I, I hope I've kept you the time. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I wish you could go longer, but uh, time is uh, not our friend this morning. But I couldn't agree more with you that, uh, you know, uh, there isn't enough uh, hours of the day to deal with this topic. This is a big topic. This is, um, this is the future. Digitization is the future. And um, I am very happy, Prof, that you have shared your insights with us. 
and you have pointed us in the right direction. Uh, I couldn't agree more with you when you spoke um, in your opening remarks about the digital divide and uh, the technology being an amplifier. Uh, taking it to our space, as I was following um, the layout and the flow from your presentation, and listening to benefit from your expertise on data and its implications. I mean, uh, as ombuds, we deal with confidential information. And thank you for helping us and reminding us this morning that as custodians of that information, we need to handle it with care and protect that information. I mean, think about it this way, uh, colleagues. From time to time, whatever complaint you may be dealing with, you'll have to request information from uh, the complainant. Uh, I'll make one example, bank statements. Bank statements is a very serious uh, private information one shares with you. So do you in your space have systems in place to protect that information so that that information doesn't uh, land in, the, in wrong hands and uh, it was compromised in your own institution? So these are the reminders this morning and the expertise that are, show, are shared with us. Uh, by Professor uh, Maharaj this morning. And lastly, as I look at the, the challenges, the challenges uh, my take, for instance, will be uh, as data custodians, do we have the latest systems? Is our technology uh, relevant today? Because uh, those who seek to uh, you know, in, infiltrate our systems or steal that information, uh, probably every day, you know, they are using the advanced technologies. So we are called upon as ombuds institutions to ensure that our IT uh, is strong. We have a team that really protects the information that comes into our hands. Ladies and gentlemen, I do not want to waste time, but this is um, just my quick wrap up of my take from the professor's um, expertise and as I was following his um, presentation this morning. The second presentation, we will go to the Q&A, ladies and gentlemen, uh, after the second speaker, as I said uh, earlier on. What will happen now is uh, we will invite uh, our colleague, Frankie, to present the video from the IOI secretary, the Austrian ombudsperson, as I said earlier, he couldn't join us. Uh, are you ready, Frankie? And then once uh, we are done with those with that video, it means uh, our speakers of the day, we are done with them. Then we can go to the Q&A. From the Q&A, then we can wrap up. And then I'll hand over to Marion Adonis to close the session for the day. But uh, I'm hoping that those uh, questions are coming and then we will look at them as they come. If you are ready, Frankie, I am uh, ready for you. Thank you. All right. Dear colleagues, I would like to take this opportunity to share some thoughts with you on the topic of digitalization and ombudsman services. Although my topic is legal and ethical questions, please do not expect a legal treatise. We all know that in many places, both on national and international levels, governments and legislators create legal frameworks for the use of digital systems and the protection of the users. However, sometimes I fear that our traditional instruments of governance are not sufficient for this. The present is already overtaking the future and we are thinking about regulating the past. And technical development is always one step ahead. Nevertheless, we have to face the challenges. But first of all, there is no reason to be pessimistic. Let us think back for a moment. Not that long ago, the question for Ombudsman Institution was whether our activities should be presented on a homepage and which results may or shall be published. Then there was discussion about the extent to which complaints should be admissible via email versus the protection of data. Both are now a matter of course for all Ombuds and are considered to be a question of contemporary service. Many of us have already joined social media networks or think about it. Some perhaps even to join TikTok for spreading information about their services. In relation to these issues, previous speakers have already set out the framework for privacy protection and secure communication. 
I would like to talk about the biggest current challenge that we are already facing, namely the use of artificial intelligence. It already determines our daily lives, in medical research, in the support of people in need, in our consumer behavior, in the preparation of legal expertises, in literature and art. In the meantime, artificial intelligence modulates itself and develops itself further. Authorities are already using artificial intelligence in many cases. In Austria, the tax return must be filed electronically and the decision is issued electronically. Original documents, such as invoices, are only requested from the taxpayer on a random basis. Of course, the selection is based on algorithm. However, it is not the algorithm that stands before me or addresses our institution, but the selected citizen concerned. Let's do a little mind game. A complainant writes his complaint with the help of ChatGPT. In the complaint, he refers to extensive legal literature and court decisions. In particular, he claims that the authority used artificial intelligence in an admissible way. Of course, he submits the complaint to our Ombudsman chatbot, as is already widely possible and used with private companies as a service. The authority, also using artificial intelligence, reject the accusations. The Ombudsman's employee, also using ChatGPT, submits the draft settlement to the Ombudsman for his signature. This takes into account Thanks to the use of artificial intelligence, all the published and unpublished decisions of the Ombudsman institutions on comparable cases. My little example raises the whole range of questions. Do our decisions now depend only on which databases are networked and programmed and how? Should we set up chatbot systems as a service to be available day and night? How do we even recognize as an institution whether artificial intelligence has been used? What if we don't agree with the outcome? Should we perhaps develop an open AI for ombudsmen? What scope for decision making do we ombudsmen have left at all? Our primary task is to control the state administration. However, the challenge will also be whether we as an institution are equipped financially in terms of personnel, but especially technically to be able to control the use of artificial intelligence at all. Many colleagues are already struggling for the necessary basic equipment, but the only concern the organizational side of our work. It will be much more difficult for us to assess the permissibility of the use of artificial intelligence. Has the state administration adhered to its own national and international framework conditions? If there are none, what criteria do we use to decide? You still remember my example with the tax return. What if disabled persons are asked to submit original receipts? This group of taxpayers depend very often on personal help, both electronically and manually. Should we now recommend that the algorithm should take this into account and not to be used for this group of people because we consider it unethical? The example shows another dilemma. After all, the algorithm is also supposed to prevent an employee of the tax authority from arbitrarily harassing certain people with orders. But isn't a differentiation necessary, not least in view of the Convention of Rights of Persons with Disabilities? Let us return to the issues that concern us as an Ombudsman institution organizationally. We all try to give as much understandable information as possible about what we are responsible for. And when we can help, nevertheless, very many people turn to us with questions that are outside our competence. Family law issues, difficulties with private companies, decisions by independent courts. The effort to then point out which office could help or where people can turn to with their problem is considerable. An ombuds chatbot set up by telephone and electronically could therefore save us a lot of work. In the meantime, chatbots could even be given a voice despectively similar to that of ombudsmen. How much research can our employees save with the increased use of artificial intelligence? Just think about the time saved alone. 
law firms are already using electronic systems to draw up contracts, we could have our own assessments and recommendations virtually written. Moreover, the systems don't make mistakes either, they don't leave anything out and they take everything into account. Of course, we should use digital achievements. Otherwise, there would be no webinar possible. Remember, how many were dependent on digital communication in times of the pandemic? Also, we as ombudsman institutions. What is actually at stake in the question of whether and to what extent we ourselves use digital systems? The systems themselves have no ethics, even though science is already working on the development on digital emotional behavior. Does the question of ethics arise for us at all? The Austrian philosopher Konrad Paul Lissmann has stated on the subject, the triumph of apparate uses can only be explained by one motive. We want to deal less and less with people in our lives. This is precisely what does not correspond to the ethics of ombudsman institutions. The model and concept of the ombudsman has survived for centuries since 1809 and not only by tradition. It is still modern and especially in view of increasing digitalization more topical than ever. Because the motive for our activity is we want and should deal with more people in life. The very fact that we are no courts and administrative authorities opens up enormous scope for us. If we identify maladministration, it is usually a violation of the law. However, it does not have to be. We can make a recommendation even if the authority itself has acted in accordance with the law. We can overrule the findings of artificial intelligence if the state action does not comply with the principles of equity. These are then definitely not decisions based on zero one. Ever since, we had to be careful applying this wide decision-making scope. We have to give good reasons for our recommendations and suggestions and do our best to convince authorities and sometimes legislators to act differently. And we must ensure an open, direct access to us for all those seeking advice and help. The motto, for people, by people, may be a kind of guideline for us. To return to the beginning of my sketch on the subject, there is indeed no reason for pessimism, because one thing artificial intelligence is not human. But our greatest challenge will possibly be to accompany increased digitalization with an increased offer of personal contact with us. However, I would like to conclude my remarks by pointing out that the translation of my contribution is based on the digital translation program DeepL. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much to Honorable Gabby Swartz in absentia. Uh, thank you, Frankie, for sharing the video with us. We truly appreciate it. I think, ladies and gentlemen, um, this is also an eye-opener because, again, the second speaker, in my view, reinforces the idea that there's no turning back. Digitization is the future. And therefore, as ombuds, we must uh, understand what is digitization. I wish if Gabby was here, I would have asked a few questions, but I will send mine uh, to her directly because I like the example she made that, uh, for instance, filing the tax returns. Because um, I, I'll speak this subject to correction um, uh, colleagues, but I know SARS recently surprised all of us as South Africans, where for the first time, I think uh, SARS was, um, you know, doing the tax evaluation um, electronically. You don't, you, you, you don't need to file them. They do a random, a random thing. And if your name is picked up, they can tell you now if they owe you or you owe them. So in my view, I, I'm, I'm reminded now by what uh, Gabby said in her presentation about the AI, the artificial intelligence, that is, um, the, that is digitization. And uh, whether that is fair or not fair, given her example of the handicapped people fitting in that space. So this, these complaints, uh, as this uh, digitization comes um, full on, 
into our lives. We, we must embrace it and be ready as institutions to look at um, its implementation and whether its implementation is fair and whether its implementation really uh, it does not violate the fundamental rights and it is uh, consistent with the spirit of good governance. Uh, so these are the areas that come out for me. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, in her absence, as I said earlier on, if you have questions for Honorable Gabby Suarez, you can then send those questions uh, to the facilitators uh, of this uh, webinar. Uh, Frankie, they will uh, guide you to the right direction so that uh, they can be sent straight to the Honorable Gabby, the Austrian uh, Ombudsperson. Then uh, the answers will be sent directly to you. But I want to go back to our earlier speaker or our first speaker, Professor Maharaj. They are uh, questions, Prof, that have come. Uh, ladies and gents, we are doing the Q&A. Uh, I have two questions that uh, have popped up uh, in my screen that I want to uh, uh, refer to you, Prof, so that you can respond. The first question I want us to look at uh, the part is, is the following. The colleague is asking here, Prof, do you think it is proper to have a case management system that contain complainants information or complaints information hooked up on a central system that the Ombuds office has no direct control on? Did you get that, Prof? Yes, I did. Uh, <clears throat> the the there's two parts to that question, right? The question is about a, a, a technical system to store all your data. In, in your case, you're calling it a case management system. And the other part is you know, the, the centrally stored without the local office. Um, I'm assuming that's what the import of the question is, having a control over it. Uh, the first part's a technical uh, question that's easy to answer. Yes, uh, you know, centralized storage of uh, information is important because you can then um, query that data from multiple angles, uh, you know, and, and, and many people can have access to the data without duplicating the data. One of the biggest problems in data management is data duplication. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 advocate, you, you might want a file and your colleagues using the file, they say, okay, I'll copy it for you and I'll send you a copy. Then you're using the file and somebody else wants a file and, you know, a part of the file. So it's copied again. So before you know it, there, there are five or 10 copies of that file or parts of the file floating around your office and, and sometimes leaving your office and going home and you know, it gets lost. The, the more things you have, the more instances you have of a data set, the more likely it is it's gonna get lost. So central storage of data pre prevents that. If you can store your data in a proper way, in other words, uh, in, in a proper file storage system where you can access the data and use it on that file storage system, you don't have to download it to your local server. You don't have to download it to your local computer. You, you read it, you can edit it. And of course, all these uh, editing rules and all we built into your system. That is a good system. That is a system used throughout the world. Technologists use it, uh, you know, uh, programmers use it all the time in terms of central repositories. Uh, we have a technical name for them. We call them Git repository, G-I-T, where people go in and create software, open source software in a collaborative way. It works well. And the technology is robust to be able to protect it. Uh, it just it just hasn't crossed the boundary from from the technologists to the legal side kind of thing, but it's there. Uh, the other side is uh, so the, so the other question was you know uh, that that the local office doesn't have access to. Uh, I, I don't understand that question. Everybody will have access to a central database of storage. That access will be determined by privilege. And this is important. When you when you when you when you're securing data, there are various models to secure data. But if you you know in the military uses top secret and, and, and uh, eyes only, and you know we we see these in the movies. Similarly, you need to identify your data within the ombuds office. You need to classify the data, and then people will have classifications, and your system will match that to that. So if you are classified um, uh, advocate as the head of your office, so that you have access to all the data then so, so it will be, but your subordinate will have access to only a certain subset of the data, depending on his or her rank. Okay, so that can be managed. So data access shouldn't be free for all. It should never be free for all in any case. It should be dependent upon the level of the data and the seniority 
or the level of access. And also, it's important to understand, the fact that you're the boss doesn't mean you should have access to all the data. Because having access to the data just brings with it a responsibility for you to protect the data. Why own something? It's like, you know, uh, uh, my wife owns jewelry. And she says, it's very valuable. I say, are you prepared to sell it? She says, no. Then I said, there's no value in it. It's just a liability, okay? So why own something that you're not, you know, so it's the same with data. It doesn't matter that you have the right of access. You should not take that, out, right? Because it just creates a responsibility, okay? So, you know, that, that's my shortish answer to a, to a complex question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. That is uh, really helping us. The second question now is um, the following. To avoid the risk of using outdated technology as ombuds institutions, uh, is there any technological devices that could be used in this regard? Or you may think of what is your take, Prof? Yeah, sure. I mean, again, the technology understands this. Uh, technologists understand this very well. It's called web services. Uh, it's, it's called a platform as a service. You may have seen these terms, SAAS, software as a service, PAAS, platform as a service. This is technology as a service generally. So, so you would go to your office at the Cape Ombudsman's office for Cape, uh, Cape Province, your know, Western Cape would say, listen, we want to be the latest, but we don't want to buy, we don't want to own the technology. What we'll do is we'll contract with the service provider, we'll virtualize our entire office into the cloud, Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure Web Services. You'll put it in the cloud and then you will use, and you'll have terminals, any computer would do for that, which you'll access it you know, via a robust uh, internet link, of course, right? And that's it. So then as the technology changes, the cloud services change the technology, your service level agreement will determine how that happens. It's actually very easily done. That way you're not investing in technology because technology is a sunk cost. There's no way you're gonna recoup that. You invest in your web services and invest in a, a proper partnership with a company that, that, that does that for you. Okay, thank you. You're muted. Uh, yeah. th thank you, Prof. Uh, we appreciate it again. Um, I think I, there are no more questions except there's a comments uh, where one says digitization should be taken more seriously by ombuds institutions. And another request, uh, I think it's for you, um, Frankie, where colleagues request the presentations by Prof and the video that you shared that uh, they can, um, you know, uh, go back to it um, and refresh memory and uh, share it amongst their teams. But I, I, see, to... I, I see no further questions from my side. Uh, yeah, perhaps if I can just make a quick comment. Yes, uh, it's important. Uh, the 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 uh, uh, Ombud, uh, I forget her name, Gabby, uh, uh, advocate, who, who spoke about AI. You know, I think it's very important, and I'm not going to get into yeah, her talk maybe. now, but mm -hmm. it's very important for us to understand that artificial intelligence, many of us, when we think about it, I guarantee you many people in this audience are thinking about it as, if, as a glorified uh, uh, search engine. You know, they're thinking, and, and, and the terminology we use, we talk of simil similarity, we talk of plagiarism when we talk of AI, oh, and, and, and we talk about it referencing things. That's not what mm. AI is. It's, it's a large language model. It talks like you and I, not as well as you and I talk, but it, 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 it constructs sentences on a statistical basis. It's important that we understand that. It's not a database, which is why when we talk about AI doing referencing, and we surprise it doesn't reference properly. It's just not supposed to do that. It's 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 not even looking at the web as you and I would look at the web when you do a search. It doesn't. In fact, ChatGPT, ninety nine percent of the people who use ChatGPT they use three point five GPT three point five. It's not even connected to the web. It is based on its learnings from September 2021. 2021 or twenty twenty. I think that's it. That's when it stops. It doesn't have any other information in its, in its database. It doesn't have any learning. As a child learns, that's how ch uh, large language model learns. Now, later versions, of course, are linked to the web. It makes it more sophisticated. But I guarantee you, most people are using ChatGPT now, not paying the $20 a month for the ChatGPT4. They're using the free version, which is not even connected to the web. It is just a language model. 
And I think it's important that we understand that and, and understand the ramifications of that when, when we talk about it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, before you go, I will afford you another last opportunity for your closing remarks. I just want to take you on on the issue you ventured into uh, from Gabby's video, the artificial intelligence. Was my understanding correct when I said, um, uh, I think you must be aware of this, that SARS uh, recently, or this um, current financial year, they, they have indicated, in fact, they have, uh, they have um, done the, the, the random um, tax returns of, of people and just responded to them to say, you, we owe you X amount or we don't owe X amount. And people hadn't really, uh, on their own, uh, approached SARS to say, uh, I'm presenting myself for tax evaluation. Are we seeing SARS in our own uh, local space, South Africa, moving to the artificial intelligence to assess uh, our uh, tax returns? Or um, I'm, I'm confusing things. Well, well, the example you gave doesn't uh, make that obvious or not obvious. I mean, they could or they could not. The fact that they contact you randomly is not a function of AI. You know, they, they could do okay. that. They, the fact that they could call on you randomly and do an audit uh, or do a uh, tax evaluation. Mm -hmm. uh, but I suspect that uh, the, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's resource intensive. AI mm -hmm. does offer uh, clear advantages in resource mm -hmm. intensive work where they can automate stuff. So it's not, it's not unlikely that they're using it, but there's no evidence um, that they are or not from from that particular instance. Okay. I'm glad but I, I spoke. Surprised you. They are. Yeah. I'm glad I spoke subject to correction earlier. Thank you, Prof. Uh, any uh, two minutes? Any closing remarks you you, you want to talk about? But before I do that, I see something is popping up. Uh, yeah. What kind of automation would you propose for ombuds office across that would enable uniqueness and ease of communication? Kind of like this one is a deep dive. Uh, you want to respond to, to that, Prof? Yeah, well, I can try. I mean, again, I you know, I don't know. I, I know from a public perspective what an ombuds office does. I don't yeah. know it from an ombuds perspective. Mm -hmm. But from, a, from an information sharing perspective, I think what an ombuds office needs to have is a, its own virtual private network. I mean, and I think many, many ombuds office uses these things. It needs its own uh, uh, centralized storage of data within its uh, uh, offices. It needs uh, some way to digitize content because many of your complaints come in from the public as probably handwritten complaints, as, as probably as written complaints rather than digital complaints. I think the first step is to digitize those things and, 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 and technology now allows you to do that. AI allows you to digitize content very, very easily and accurately. And once mm. the content is digitized, then you can share and you can, you know, and, and I, I think it, um, but it's a steep learning curve. Yeah. And the difficulty, uh, difficulty you face is that most people, uh, and, and this is just a fact, I mean, uh, most people are there to do a job uh, rather than there to innovate and, and you know, uh, do things differently to try and get people to, and, and I'm talking about across all industries, okay? Because the learning curve is steep. Uh, there needs to be some motivation for people to go and embrace the new technologies to learn it. And I think there is motivation there. We just need to understand how to do it. And yes, then, then, then there's a whole slew. I mean, I, I can't give you specific examples, uh, but there's a whole slew of automation that's available to any. Uh, and the fact that private legal firms are doing it very successfully, means that ombuds officers should be able to do it as well. Thank you. So you muted? Yeah. Another question for you, Prof, is um, considering the challenge of human rights violation by use of technology, yeah. do we have enough legal protection? What is oh, your, 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 your view? Yeah, I, I, I think technology is always going to outstrip legislation. The fact is, you guys know better than I do how long it takes to get a legislation, any law passed through any country. Technology is measured in days. Right now, AI, the advances in AI are measured in hours, not even days. If you follow AI like I do, every hour there's a new innovation. 
these things outstrip uh, legislation. Um, so I, do, I don't, I, I don't have an answer to that, but I just know that uh, the the legal people are always chasing. Uh, they, they're never going to catch up. What we need is some kind of legal framework uh, that allows flexibility. But the legal framework in itself is, you know, I, I don't think it's very flexible. I mean, it's it's, it's designed to be rigid. Um, that's my opinion. But so yes, uh, there is no. Technology is, is always going to out, outpace uh, legislation. It always has, and it's always going to be a problem. I mean, right now, South Africa has faced a problem: cybersecurity. You know, we are still talking mm. about uh, passing cybersecurity legislation that talks about stuff that is not even current anymore. It's gone. There are new threats out there, and and we, we can't even address it. So yeah, so it's it's a big problem. But technologists don't wait for lawyers; they just go and do things. You know, so and that's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Thank you, Prof. Um, there is another question from the Ombudsman of Angola. Sure. He's asking, in view of the insecurities in the use of technology in today's world, in the defense of the citizens' rights, what future do we have for those rights? Are we before a big issue or are we before a big issue here? Yeah, we are. We are, in front of, we, we are facing a major issue. But it's not new. This issue has been there for a while. The, uh, the, the, the problem is, again, as I pointed out, technology will continue uh, to advance. And the fact is that the uh, general public is having access to this technology without the necessary knowledge. It's like, it's like uh, you know, buying a Ferrari and giving it to a 10-year-old and saying, go and drive. It's it, in, in the hands, it's, it's a wonderful car, but in the hands of this child, it's, it's a dangerous weapon for the child and for the public. This is my view, you know, we, we're rolling out broadband, which is what we should, but governments are not simultaneously rolling out education and, and awareness campaigns to the public. Certainly not in South Africa, and I suspect in large parts of Africa. Uh, I don't know, you know, if it's the same in Europe. Uh, I suspect it's less so. But, but this is a problem. So we, we are equipping the public with technology. They expect this technology to be used to their benefit, but they don't understand uh, their responsibilities, as I pointed out earlier, towards protecting their privacy within this technological domain. So it's, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword, as I pointed out. It's useful, but we need to educate people about its dangers so that they can take the responsibility of protecting their own data. Uh, so so you, you can't stop it. I mean, to the ombud of Angola, you know, as I pointed out, the fact that you drive to work every day in your car remains dangerous. You could be in an accident and die, but you do that because you mitigate those risks. I'm saying we can mitigate the risks of technology through education and training. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Prof. Uh, I wish we had more time, but... Uh... Maybe some other time, Frankie will bring us back uh, on this subject. As you said, uh, you know, uh, technology is moving very fast, so we will always play this uh, catch-up game. But uh, in less than one minute, Prof, any final thoughts, closing remarks? Uh, no, 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 nothing much, advocates. I mean, uh, I, I've said it just now, you know, most important thing is we need to take responsibility for our own privacy protections. And when I say we, I mean our immediate environment. It's, it's each one teach one kind of thing. We need to teach ourselves first. YouTube is a fantastic resource. You don't have to pay anybody. You just have to use the resources available. Uh, and then speak to your families, speak to your friends. And, and in that way, maybe this whole thing will snowball. But uh, it's our responsibility. It's not, it's not anybody else's. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, I just want to say we are wrapping up now and uh, thank you for, for your time and thank you for the comments. Some of what came was just positive comments that uh, are shared by colleagues and the questions have been fielded by professor. And as I said, the rest of other questions uh, to the Austri Austrian ombudsperson person will be sent directly to, to her to respond directly to you. And I just hope uh, we have learned a lot today Digitization is the biggest next thing we are facing. And uh, we must, uh, as the Ombuds institution and in the Ombuds world, continuously embrace ourselves, embrace ourselves rather for this challenge. 
And the professor has done a marvelous job today just to prick us, point us in the right direction, and just the, the thoughts and the insights he has given us. And of course, uh, the Austrian ombudsperson via video uh, in absentia, that was awesome as well. I'm now going to hand over uh, to Mar Marion Adonis uh, for a vote of thanks. And as I said, uh, once again, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, to the IOMA, the IOI, and everybody else. Thank you. Over to you, Marion. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for your participation. Um, we, um, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed participants, distinguished speakers, and honored guests, I want to express our heartfelt gratitude to every one of you for your participation in the webinar which was organized by the AYORC, the African Ombudsman Research Center and the International Ombudsman Institute, Institute in commemoration of Ombuds, Ombuds Day 2023. Our esteemed uh, speakers, Professor Manoj Miraj and Honorable Gabby Schwartz deserve our profound appreciation for, their, for generously sharing their valuable insights, expertise and knowledge on critical topics such as privacy rights, confidentiality in the digital era, and legal and ethical considerations. Your contributions have truly enlightened and advanced our understanding of these complex issues. I thank uh, Dr. Paul Swanepoel, Advocate Kuleka Galeka, and Hon Honorable Chris Field for delivering warm, welcoming addresses that set the tone for this event. Your support has been invaluable and deeply appreciated. Um, our facilitator, Honorable Busumsi Magwebu, des deserves special recognition for skillfully guiding us through the session and ensuring its seamless flow. Your expertise and leadership have been instrumental in making this event a resounding success. We especially want to acknowledge your willingness to step in as a facilitator at short notice, which is genuinely appreciated by the AOP team. We would also like to acknowledge and express our gratitude to all the participants, including Ombudsman officers, their staff, and interested in individuals who joined us from across the, across the globe. Your active engagement and commitment to the Ombuds profession are truly commendable. A heartfelt thank you to our interpreter for providing Spanish language interpretation. Um, in future webinars, we hope to expand the interpretation to services to cover other Ayoma languages. Lastly, we want to thank Hazel Langer and the dedicated staff from the UKZN Corporate Relations who work be tirelessly behind the scenes. Your efforts have been in, in, indispensable in bringing this event to fruition. As we conclude the webinar, let us carry forward the knowledge and insights gained today to enhance the role of Ombuds in the digital age. Together, we can navigate the challenges and seize the opportunities presented by technology while upholding the principles of privacy, confidentiality, legality, and ethics. Please note that the AYORC team will post the recordings, the presentations, and the related documents, as well as external links on our website within the next week. We encourage you to revisit and share this valuable content with your colleagues. Uh, previous webinars can also be accessed from the same site. Uh, I also want to advise participants that attendance certificates will be issued uh, to those who attended the entire webinar. And uh, the final webinar is scheduled for November, the uh, final webinar for the year is scheduled for November the 28th. And that topic is leveraging Grammarly and ChatGPT for investigation reports. Um, we look forward to your participation. Once again, thank you for your participation and contributions. And remember, never click the link. We are wishing you all a fruitful and inspiring Ombuds Month 2023. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to Prof Maharaj. And thank you to Honorable Vusumzi. We I appreciate second. you very much. Thank you. Awesome. Thank Bye. you guys as well. Have a good day, Feather. Have thank a good you. day. Bye. You Bye. too. Thank you. Bye-bye.